episodes. I'll, uh, yeah, Sabrina, if you want to hit the record on there. Um, as always, uh, the yin and yang that hosts this program here with uh, Kyle and myself, um, we welcome you back again. Uh, this is actually a pretty exciting one for us, too, because it's the first time that uh, we are actually partnering with the Architecture and Design Exchange in downtown Dallas, um, a neighbor of ours, but also is the home of the Architecture Foundation as well as the AIA. Um, but we're excited because of their move downtown and the way that they saw their future and sort of creating a place where you could meet to talk not just about design, but about um, all the things that shape it as well. And so we're going to fit obviously into kind of a larger umbrella of that. But um, I, and I think it's our dream too to just host a a show internally there. I think Kyle said it's going to be a good opportunity to finally call people out face to face. So <laughs> that'll be fun too. But uh, we're really looking forward to this partnership with them and um, thank them very much for uh, supporting us and seeing this to uh, what we hope will be a much broader audience. Uh, so Zaida, I see you're on the call. Thank you. Um, a couple of talks coming up here, as you can see on the list, um, and we may actually switch this format to Zoom in the future, so just keep uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. But uh, I have some exciting talks coming up with Dorothy DiStefano next week uh, from Australia, the Musicant Group following from Minneapolis, and then uh, finally on this schedule, uh, Buck Johnston and Camp Bosworth from Wrong Marfa. Uh, Buck's also on city council for Marfa, so that should be interesting to see how a city such as that is responding to our current uh, situation that we're in in the world. So some good talks coming up, um, including ours today. Um, about seven months ago, uh, I found myself in China with a client and a colleague, and on the table in front of me was um, a drawing set of an exact replica of the gateway arch that they were going to erect in the middle of the country, which um, as the St. Louis and uh, I cringed. And um, so they asked if I knew the designer of the arch and of course, Eero Saarinen, but then asked if I could call him and see if he would want to come <laughs> in and meet. But um, of course, arrow has been gone for some time, uh, but you know, took out a little um, flyer and just said, maybe I can get a hold of someone from the Gateway Arch to see if they'd want to participate and help out with the discussion. And that's how I met Eric Morcheski, who um, at that time was the executive director of the Gateway Arch Foundation in St. Louis. Um, and it was no small task. It was the largest privately or public private partnership in national park history at the time, which I'm sure Eric will talk about here soon. Uh, but since that time, Eric has actually started out on his own uh, with Nimble Strategies. Uh, it's a group that seeks to empower small businesses, nonprofits, and public-private enterprises through trusted counseling partnerships. Um, the consultants here, as you see on the screen, um, they definitely have real-world experience and a significant tenure and track record um, that they offer to all the groups that they touch, uh, most recently Thanksgiving Square Foundation in Dallas. Uh, but Eric is the CEO. Um, he had a background uh, with the Gateway Arch Park Foundation and even prior uh, working with Gallagher and Associates, um, an exhibitions design firm. Um, but since then, with his um, leadership in the group, has really taken on this approach of paying forward what uh, he's learned to uh, small businesses, public private partnerships, and nonprofits. And just recently has brought on board um, someone with an equally impressive track record in Dion Brown, uh, who's managing the nonprofit services for Nimble. Uh, he comes from a background of working with the Underground Railroad Museum in Cincinnati, uh, the National Blues Museum, which recently started in St. Louis, not to be uh, confused with the St. Louis Blues hockey team, but uh, the Blues history in the city, which is very robust. Um, and is everywhere in many of the neighborhoods that you um, experience, um, as well as the B.B. King Museum and even some of his first experience with the Exploration Place in Wichita. Um, should also note that he's also retired from the Air Force after 21 years, so he's definitely seen his fair share of really paying it forward to everyone that um, he comes in contact with. 
Uh, so the two of them coming in today, I think, is a very fitting start as we partner with a nonprofit and ourselves. And uh, just to kind of learn about how the power of the public-private partnership and uh, working with nonprofits can really lead to transform or transformative outcomes for communities, uh, developments, and for everyone involved. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Eric and Dion, and I believe Eric's going to start with the show. So uh, with that said, gentlemen, welcome. Yeah, welcome. And as I always do, I try to inter not interrupt, but I just want to say again, as I do usually in most of the, the sessions, is thank you, uh, you two, uh, Dion and Eric, for taking the time to, to be here. We're we're very excited about uh, uh, what y'all do in terms of your organizations, but the impact you have on communities and impact a, a big topic for any uh, design company we want to make a difference and, and you guys are doing that and we really appreciate you being here and we're interested to, really interested to see what you have to say so thank you and a quick reminder one thing i didn't say at the beginning there is a chat bar built into teams that you can click on at the bottom of your screen uh, that we ask that you send questions into send questions at any time throughout the discussion uh, because we really want this to be interactive with you all so as you send those in and once uh, eric um, gives the introduction here of his group, then we'll turn directly to those questions as well as some of our own. So uh, with that, uh, Eric and Dion, all yours. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Kyle. You know, we set out about a year ago with this idea that we had, I had led the largest public-private partnership in National Park Service history, working with the National Park Service, the city of St. Louis, and several other partners that but we've worked with every day, as well as 30 or 40 other ancillary partners that all had important say in what we were doing when we were renovating a little over 110 acres in total, and also building about 150,000 square feet of new museum space, uh, exhibit space within the underground, uh, the uh, underneath the arch. And so, you know, Working with that, you get to learn a lot of different things, a lot of different people, and, and work with a lot of great groups around the country. And taking that knowledge and work, the experience that we gained from that, as well as working with small businesses and nonprofits prior to that, and especially museums around the world through Gallagher and Associates, we saw an opportunity to really support groups that maybe were underrepresented when it came to bringing in high level experience. And so when Dion came aboard, that really added to that flavor of that experience as well. And so you can kind of see here, we focus on really three key areas, pu public-private partnerships, nonprofits, small businesses. A lot of my background is finance and accounting. I love numbers, so you can see that data analytics piece in there too. Uh, that's really where a lot of this presentation today comes from is the idea that a building within a space or a green space within a space, the museum or, or the green space has an economic impact on the surroundings. And it's probably seen best in the world or at least one of the best spaces in the world with Central Park. The Central Park Conservancy has a 300 plus million dollar endowment and primarily their fundraising comes from the people who live right around that area. It's the easiest example we can give because most people understand the Central Park area. And so you look at it and, and you see the value because some of that real estate is the most expensive real estate in the world. And so when we think today about how how that affects the surrounding area, when you install a museum or you build a green space into an area, it does have a huge economic impact on it. And so we want to kind of talk through what that economic impact looks like, but also how that's being affected today with COVID and, and where it'll go in the future. And so, especially that second piece, we really wanna keep that very interactive and really hear your thoughts as well as questions on, on how this is affecting current projects or future projects. So it's a little bit of kind of what we're, what we're looking at today and, and how we came to this, this idea. Um, you can see here, there's a little bit of background on Dion and I. I led the largest public-private partnership in National Park Service history. I led the nonprofit responsible for it, so $380 million project. Um, 
we provided $221 million in private funding to help fund that. The, the rest of the money came from city, state, and federal grants. And uh, the first time a region has chosen to tax themselves to pay for a national park site. So a few very unique pieces within this project. Um, and I've been very fortunate to get to speak to NAFTA, World Urban Parks Commission, uh, and several others around the world on, on some of these pieces. Um, Dion, thought you can you can describe yourself better than I can. But uh, Dion, Dion, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Am I what still? he said was just brilliant, no. though, just so you now know. Can, now we can hear you. All right. There you go. Okay, thanks. All right. I'm 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 clicking away and trying to get it off of mute. But anyway, thanks, Eric, Kyle, Mike. I appreciate uh, this opportunity. As Eric said, uh, I have 15 plus years in nonprofit management. Uh, I've worked with several organizations on uh, actually the most current one that I'm not part of, but I started was the uh, expansion of the B.B. King Museum through their strategic plan that we put in place five years ago it's coming to fruition and it's just an honor to be here and be a part of this discussion and hopefully eric and i can give you the answers that you need or give you some uh information that you can use for the future thank you so we're going to take a look at some of the projects that we've worked on hands-on and and kind of the economic impact that surrounded them and then we'll flow more into how that affects what's going on today. Dion, it's all you on the Blues Museum. So when we opened the Blues Museum back in, I got here in 2000, in St. Louis in 2015, and Lumiere Casino was our largest donor. Actually, the museum would not be built had it not been Lumiere Casino stepping up donating over six million dollars for the project the developer for that project was uh amos harris he had the vision of turning in washington avenue in st louis as an entertainment district and he wanted to anchor it all around the national blues museum and when he did that the restaurants they flocked to the area it's a like a three block area and restaurants hotels apartments they all sprung up around that area to anchor in on that. And actually, since that development has started, he's actually there have places for another actual night uh, live venue place, uh, country music. So that's the scope of what the National Blues Museum brought to downtown St. Louis. And B.B. King, which we'll talk about later, it even added more into that community. Oh, okay. So Eric's going to slide right in too. So let me just keep on rolling here. So with the B.B. King Museum, it's an incredible story of a town of 12,000 people. And, you know, uh, what happened with the development of the B.B. King Museum, we were allowed, I mean, seven new restaurants opened, which employed, I mean, they had a, their unemployment rate was at like 17.8%. The museum opened up, seven new restaurants opened, and tourism brought in a town of 12,000 people. We were bringing in over 36,000 visitors to that area, which impacted that community so strong because of the restaurants, because of the shopping. People wanted to feel that Delta experience. Uh, uh, the Mississippi Cruise Line, they brought in, they added the Mississippi, uh, the B.B. King Museum onto their schedule of tours because it was such a destination spot. Tour companies from all over the world specifically Europe, would flock to Indianola, Mississippi, just to see that museum. Uh, Grant-wise, Eric was speaking earlier on grants. We had several grants, but one of the grants that I'm most proud of was the $165,000 that you see on the screen. And what that did, it was just pass through money. And what I mean by that, we got an individual donor who wanted to program, I mean, to fund every one of our programs that we were uh, doing. And so that 165,000 came to the museum, but with that 165,000, we were able to employ people from the community, from teachers to counselors, to come and help us do our mission. 
actually that program was actually recognized by Michelle Obama as part one of the first museums to be awarded the Get Fit Right Get Fit program, which was an honor, you know, bestowed upon us. And it was just a great, great inspiration for what we were able to accomplish down there. And they're still doing marvelous things down there through the name of B.B. King, which B.B. King, and I'm going to be quiet at this one, Eric, B.B. King, the museum, the name is what draws you, but it's such a historical tour through what was going on in America during his lifetime is what the museum is about. You have his artifacts, but it's more about the community, what the community is about, and what was going on during his lifespan during that time. And with that, Eric, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, I mean, B.B. King is actually where Dion first came onto my radar because Gallagher and Associates designed the the renovation of the B.B. King yes. Museum. And it's a beautiful space that really has brought a vibrancy to a community. As, as Dion mentioned, you know, very small community, 12,000 people, but bringing a re- considerably reducing unemployment rate Yes. You know, by bringing in those restaurants and those tours, you know, 17.8% may not sound as bad today because we have, are at maybe a 15 or 17% unemployment rate. But when when that was going on, that was astronomical. And, you know, especially with those grants going to those schools, it has such a profound impact on that whole population in that community. And, and Eric, even, even to stretch beyond that, I didn't want to take up too much time, mindful of the time. But see, it also... Uh, we created the creative economy out of that. And so you had bars, not only the restaurants, but the bars start uh, prospering off of it. People started creating, there was a, a mobile car wash that was created out of this right because people would come in with their big um, RVs need to be cleaned. We even, at the BB King Museum, we opened up a lot just for campers to come and spend the night. So, and then there was other bed and breakfasts that grew out of that. So the vision of, at that time, Bill McPherson, who was the board chair, and the city to envision the B.B. King Museum being put there, it's doing wonders for that community. It really is. So, you know, I uh, have been informed that you all will not be able to hear the sound to this, but only I will. So I... uh, will tell you this is all brilliant and it's truly inspiring uh, but unfortunately you you don't get to hear it um, and apparently what we did at the Gateway Arts National Park we felt this video does a nice job sharing everything that kind of went into it because this is a museum this is a green space this is a park area and it has such a profound impact when we look at projects, this is this is the centerpiece, this is the keystone of, of downtown St. Louis. And so it had been an area that at one point saw as many as 4.6 million visitors a year, with about 80% of those visitors coming from out of town. And that number had fallen to about 2.4 million visitors a year. And so it really hadn't been touched since the museum opened in 1976. Uh, I think it sounds familiar to those of you in Dallas when you think of Thanksgiving Square, which hasn't had a lot of real update since 1977 when it was opened. And so when we ran this project, we, we came to the community and we said, this is going to have a profound impact. What we told the community is this would have the impact of one additional Cardinals baseball season every year. And so that impact was understandable. Instead of saying that it was going to be $320 $320 million a year, which I think most people would say, wow, that's a big number, but $250 million, $200 million, $500 million get a little bit lost when you're trying to relate to a community. And so by relating it to something that people can understand by Michael, who wears his Cardinals baseball cap proudly, um, saying it was the equivalent of adding a Cardinals baseball season to the economy of St. Louis, that really was well received but well understood as as well because people said i've been to those games i know how crowded they are i know how much i paid for that hot dog um it's just a good way of how you can relate to a community to help them understand the impact that you're trying to make and so you can see here this was an economic impact study that i did as 
as a part of the foundation and took a look at where there was this economic impact happening. And you can see the hot spots. This is all within about five miles of, uh, of the arch. If you look at the furthest out hot spot on that top left corner, but everything that's on the right on that list, that's all within one mile of the arch. And so a huge impact that's going on really, you know, great things coming in, new apartments, new hotels, new restaurants. You can see uh, the first cidery in St. Louis came in, um, really kind of a fun place to go sit outside. They renovated the old fire station, um, which was really just a fun use of the whole project. And so really just an innovative restoration to all of downtown St. Louis. And we also wanted to kind of take a look then on what that meant. So we had promised before the project we would have an economic impact for the region of about $320 million. What you can see here is through the economic study, they actually came to about 19,000 jobs, $965 million in income, um, and $1.4 billion in GDP. And that income means so much because what we're talking about when you have 80% of your visitation coming from outside the region is those are new dollars into the economy. You're not recycling those dollars throughout and, and that those new dollars have such a profound impact and you can see what that means directly right here. And so, you know, when you're looking at a project, you need to understand what the ramifications are of what you're adding. And so depending on what you're trying to attract with it, you need to look at you know, are, are there locals or tourists as the primary visitor? For for instance, parks receive 90% of their visitation from within three miles. So if you're adding park space, you need to understand that the restaurants are going to have to live off of the neighborhood. But if you're adding <coughs> museum, that can be that can also be true if you're talking about art museums or a lot of attractions that are more common within other cities, a science museum, a lot of that comes from a, a local and regional standpoint. But if you're talking about something that's unique, like B.B. King, like the Blues Museum or the Arch, those start attracting an outside presence as much or more than an inside presence. And so understand your attraction if you're looking at what type of impact can be made and, and what should be added to support it. So, you know, hotels need out of town guests to support it. You know, restaurants need a mixture. And so we really had a big discussion at the Arch about what that mixture looked like because restaurants were seeing a lot of the office crowd, but they weren't getting a lot of that tourist crowd and resident crowd had disappeared for many years. So that, that renovation, that restoration was starting to allow those places to thrive. And I, I know the, uh, the barbecue place, Sugar Fire, which is connected to the Blues Museum, they own now, I feel like I can't keep up with how many they've grown to uh, and how many restaurants they've added, but um, they've consistently said the one connected to the Blues Museum is the most profitable and does the best of any restaurant that they own. And so, you know, that's because there's a connection and there's a reason for people to be here, but also because it's hitting all three of those markets, that office crowd, the tourist crowd, and the residents. Um, and so when you look at that value proposition between both the museum or green space and the community, you need to figure out how those places can impact the museum or green space, but you also need to think about how that museum and green space can support the surroundings. And so, you know, when I say that, what I mean is I've done a lot of studies across the country working with a lot of other groups, and we found some really unique value propositions uh, from different groups. So whether that was hotels, offering $1 of their hotel night to back, donated back to the foundation or organization that was really impacting their visitation, um, or whether that was the museum or green space putting on events that would create that attraction. Uh, I use a lot as we did a lot of great events. One of the, one of Dion and I's favorites because it, it actually involved both of us was Blues at the Arch. And it was a great way for us to engage the local community to return back down to the Arch. What we had found in studies was <laughs> regional residents came to the Arch once every six to 10 years. And that was primarily when people were coming in from out of town and saying, hey, what do you wanna do? Let's go see the Arch. And so 
giving people a reason to re-engage with that community allows you to then also impact those restaurants because people were out uh, the Four Seasons, as an example, built a picnic lunch that you could actually pick up at the Four Seasons in a picnic basket and bring to Blues at the Arch. So it had your dinner and snacks, had a bottle of wine in it for like $40. You could actually stop and just pick it up on your way into the park. Um, lots of restaurants starting to add that. I know Millennium Park, a great example in downtown Chicago, has seen that hold true for when they do movies and concerts in Millennium Park. A lot of the restaurants have started building basically that picnic basket to go package, including beer, wine, or anything else that really creates that engaged environment down there. You know, we we see that time and again that if you if you build it and give people a reason to be there, you can really create a thriving economy that is ancillary to that museum or green space. Eric, I'd like to add on to that. I mean, that blues at the arch, I, I don't think we can really paint the picture of how impactful that was, which everybody used to come downtown just to go to the ball game, to the Cardinals. We used to have those concerts, and I don't know if it was 7,000. I mean, that place was just swarming with people where Ruth Chris, the, the local restaurants in that area, downtown would just be flooded, not just from the 35, 40,000 people going to the ball game. But then the thousands of people that would actually come to the Blues at the Arch, which was great entertainment, plus it spread out into the community to the local establishment. So, I mean, that that is one thing that I think Eric should, you know, it was his his organization partnered with us. So it was their brainchild. We just helped out. But it, it became an incredible, incredible event that's going on. And so that continuous support and that relationship between the museum and green space and the surroundings has to go both ways or it doesn't really work for either side. If the museum and green space is creating that benefit and impact to the community, for Blues at the Arch, we went out and we were able to find sponsorships to make it all possible so that everything we did at the Arch was free of charge. St. Louis, a lot of people don't realize this, St. Louis has the second most free attractions in the country, second only to Washington, D.C. Um, free zoo, free science center, free art museum, free history museum. The arch is free. Not to go to the top, there are fees sometimes within those spaces, but to come in and see the museum at the arch is free of charge. And so it's a really unique environment, but it also means the nonprofits that are working within it, the museums and green spaces, have to get creative in how they can have that impact, but also how the, they can also be receptive for the benefits of that impact. Um, and so when I look through this, you know, what that means for the current landscape, obviously we're going through a very unique time. We're not putting 20,000 people out at Blues at the Arch probably this year. Uh, it's just not the right environment trying to get large groups of people together. And so, you know, there are 900,000 registered nonprofits in the U.S. 92% of them have a budget of less than a million dollars. And what I found really unique, all of this came from the Wall Street Journal last week. And 50% of those nonprofits have three months of cash on hand and 10% only have one month of cash on hand. And they've all lost their sales, their events, their fundraisers. And so you're going to see nonprofits closing. Uh, it's in in very similar to what you'll see with small businesses. And that's why when I say we work with nonprofits and small businesses, there are so many similarities between the two, even if you don't necessarily think of them in the same way, that it's such a, it's it makes so much sense for us to be working with both groups. And so, you know, people are trying to get creative right now. They're trying to figure out how they can keep their staff around or at least a core group of their staff. But people are also trying to figure out how they engage donors, how they engage the public so that they can keep an emotional tie to it. I gave a, a little talk with to a group in Singapore a couple of years ago and was explaining to them, one of the things, we're a very unique country with nonprofits. Nonprofits are not really something that exists in the same way abroad because we have created a tax system that encourage, encourages giving. And so as a nonprofit, what you find is everyone is still competing for the same dollars, but you need to create a relationship and an emotional tie to the donors and to the groups around you 
to get them to choose why they give their dollars to you. And so you still need to be creating that emotional tie, which is very hard if your spaces are closed down right now. And we're seeing that there are a lot of spaces closed down right now. Um, you know, what's how it's being handled. MoMA in New York announced this week that they'll be not be reopening until mid-August. They welcome about 2 million visitors a year. Just MoMA, not talking about the ancillary spaces around them. They, between revenues from ticket sales, venue rentals, from um, their gift shop and restaurants, they're losing up to $10 million a, a month for this shutdown. So you think about five, six months of shutdown, they're talking $50, $60 million in lost revenues. And while they're a larger organization and they may be able to sustain that, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy on them. Um, and so you see other groups looking through how they're going to do these things. And so some are opening but restricted. The St. Louis Zoo yesterday came out. St. Louis Zoo, largest visitor attraction in St. Louis, is <clears throat> coming out with a planned timed ticketing option. Well, 3.6 million visitors are not getting in on timed ticketing. And the other kind of key fact for MoMA, as well as the zoo, is that the summer months are your busiest months. That revenue lost is not, while I used a straight line as if every month was the same for MoMA, because I don't know what their monthly ebb and flow is, I can guarantee it's not a it's not a straight line and that these months are going to be hitting the zoo so hard because those kids are out of school. Those families that would have been going are not going to the zoo. We're talking a huge impact to all of these spaces. Dion, you want to talk a little bit about the Ohio and Tennessee museums and, and how they're handling these things? Yes, uh, very briefly. The, my friends and my colleagues at these institutions, not only Ohio and Tennessee, as Eric just talked about in New York, everybody, they're used, they're projecting 400,000 people. That's their annual visitation. There's no way that they're down to about 150,000 if everything worked out right. And as Eric mentioned, we're getting into the tourist time for museums and zoos or whatnot from March through September. That's your high visitation. And if you can't you, 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 you bulk up during those times because in the lean times come the fall and over the winter break, you don't have it. So this is an important time and this is going to very impact. And as Eric said, and I've been talking to some of my colleagues, they're trying to figure out how, what can we do to make it through this? And a lot of them, quite honestly, just won't make it. I mean, there's a big one in Dallas that's, that's struggling with that question right now. You know, so these effects really kind of tie through each other, but those reduced donations and sales, you know, cre reduced visitation, that museum and green space, you'll start to see those closures. And with those closures, I mean, if, if you think through the impact they're making, whether that's new restaurants opening around them, whether that's tourism coming into the economy, those restaurants and hotels will be closing as well. And so it, it has a very big trickle down effect to the economy surrounding these spaces. And so finding ways to uniquely engage those visitors and bring those people back down has such a profound effect on both the museum or green space itself, but also the restaurants and hotels surrounding them. Uh, so with that, you know, we, we wanted to kind of keep this more as an open forum, um, but run kind of through kind of the idea behind it all first. And so, I think we're happy to open it back up to questions and and yeah. go from there. Well, thanks, Eric and Dion. Um, so there's a couple ways, actually, we're going to try doing the questions. I think the first, uh, you're welcome to type it into the chat over on the right, but it appears that Teams, which seems to be coming out with new features by the hour, has a new one called Raise Your Hand. Uh, so if you want to click on that and actually unmute and ask your question, I'll, I'll give you a quick um, recognition and then you're able to do so. Um, I think the first thing um, just to start out the cop or start out the conversation is working with nonprofits um, as you have like what are some of the the fundamental things that you stress to nonprofits as they are starting to either undergo um, a revisioning or seeking a new facility like what are some of the things that you stress even before you start getting into some of the final outcomes? 
Uh, so, you know, I think for me, when I was with Gallagher and Associates, you know, my my big thing was living off of your revenues and using your donations to really grow your organization. And it was so much easier to say when I was on the consulting side than when I was operating myself uh, with with the Arch. And, you know, we, we had this conversation with someone yesterday, though, Dion and I did, of the idea that, you know, maybe it's not all of your annual giving, that you may need to live off of your annual giving, but not spending your endowment dollars that are coming out on on just everyday expenses. You know, if you're starting to, to burn through your annual giving, you're starting to burn through your revenues, you hit a point at some point where you're saying you're living beyond your means. How do we fix this? And what do we need to do to fix this? And I think even on smaller budgets, Deanna and I consistently can say, you find fat to trim. And so, you know, that's really what's important is, is the dollars that you're spending as a nonprofit are they going into your mission and are you delivering on your mission? I, really the two key things. And so you start to look through then of what pieces can be removed or added that will enhance your mission to the community because enhancing your mission to the community and the visibility of your mission to the community will enhance in turn, re enhance your development dollars. Exactly. Yeah, and I find that's that all you're going to say. I talked all that time, Dion, and, <laughs> and all you say is exactly. <laughs> all you do, I mean, we, we work together, so it's hard to do anything but add to it because what you do is one, you have to be very familiar with your donor base. I mean, you have to have a personal relationship with them. And at the same time, you're building a relationship within the community because the more you have that relationship in the community, is the awareness of the community of what you're doing. So even though they may not, the goal is to get them to become donors, but if nothing else is get them involved in the mission, the projects, the programming that you are doing. So it's really a community based event. And it goes beyond that also, because you also are partnering with what I used to do. Uh, there was a startup uh, convenience store right across the street from where my last location, I used them to cater 30,000 30, kids lunches every day. So now I'm building relationships. So now you're impacting the community through your nonprofit with another local business. And actually, and as a, a ED slash president, I is a requirement of me that we deal locally with the community. So from our gift shop to our food and beverage, everything had to be local to tie us into the community, to embrace this, you know, embed us into that community donors see that and it's just it's just a big old circle and sometimes we want to go with uh, outside sources because it's the nice easy way to do it but embedding yourself in the community is going to help you out in the long run it seems like for st louis too because it's also a city that's known um quite historically for its divides you know in many different uh, senses of the word that um, these projects have a way of almost healing community as well, or trying to create more inclusiveness. I know Eric, we talked about how like the Shoto Greenway, for example, is a way of actually like, is the first project to actually cross the sort of Central West End district that's probably the most, um, you know, talked about at the moment to really bring the North and the South together in the conversation, and even to the East as well. Um, and that was evident, I think, in the Arch and you know, one question I want to ask about is really the um, the importance of competition and visioning throughout these projects, because I think the Arch was able to bring in an international mindset just to look at what the possibilities are. And so kind of unlocking that potential at the beginning, you know, what are some of the things that you want to gain out of that? And then um, maybe you could talk about even the Arch, just some of the ideas that came out of it in the end. You know, I think the idea of competition is really an interesting subject because you can you can learn so much from what you don't choose as much as you learn from what you do choose right and you can find these pieces within that that can be added as new features to to what you do choose as a as a design and so the arch ran a, a 
competition that mirrored the original competition. And what it did is it brought in five design firms that were each paid to really do an initial design proposal. And, and so effectively, we had five master plans to pick from and to work off of. And we were able to kind of say, this is, this is, this is the right one for us but we might want that feature set out of another one. And we might want, you know, a gondola to go across the Mississippi river to uh, take people back and forth from Illinois to, to Missouri, or it's a really unique piece that you can add in that really can bring a lot of public input as well. So going back to what Dion was saying earlier about in, embedding yourself in the community, we, you, you can use that, to, to really talk through with the public what they what features they like out of a, each design as well. But most people really learn from that visually a lot better than they do with 30 words or 50 words or a thousand words even that tell you what you're intending to do by seeing something very visually. We, whether we're designers or not, can really respond with what parts we like about it and what parts we don't. So you can get a much better engagement from the community to make them feel like they're a part of it. And so I think that's really important. We saw that too in the project in China where bringing in different groups, you know, allowed for a real understanding of what, what was being looked for even by the central government in China for the project. And that <clears throat> maybe doesn't get fleshed out as well when you work with one group individually. Now, if you were the one group they picked, you may, may disagree with that standpoint. <laughs> but <laughs> as a part of what's best for the community that, that process that can really embed the community into the project really has a profound impact. I would assume for the both of you, as you've kind of witnessed that, um, actually, Dion, were you going to say something to that? Yeah, if I could chime in real quickly, yeah. as far as what green space nonprofits can do, what we did at the Blues in the Arch, it was open to everybody. I mean, you had young, old, black, white, uh, every nationality, it was there, and then on some nights he had up to seven thousand. I mean, by the end of the series, you'd have seven thousand people there. It's bringing everybody together, and what it gave to, for me, it gave us the platform to give our messages. You know, you got a seven thousand people collective audience there. That gave the Arch Foundation a chance to give their message. Gave the Blues Museum a chance to give theirs. And so, furthermore. The National Blues Museum, we did live stream. And what that live stream did, we broadcast over the whole world. So we had people calling in. I mean, actually, like you have the chat going on now. People would be chatting. We would real time chat with them during these. Con uh, and it brought the community together. I mean, in our crowds, it was such a diverse crowd. It just, he I mean, it was our platform to heal the ills of St. Louis, because as you know, St. Louis has uh, big uh, big issues here, and we use the blues as a format to address hard topics. Yeah, uh, certainly did. And, um, you know, even just to draw from the cultures of place too. You know, and be inclusive of all different populations of the city. You know, there's oh. both projects have been very transformative in that regard. Um, Kyle, you want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah, and I apologize if you hear dogs running around or kids. Um, yeah, this question is for Dion. Um, okay, you've you've done some incredible work. You you've led some amazing organizations. And what's amazing to me is the the trickle effect uh, that you bring with the way you think and and your leadership. Uh, the the it's amazing that the lives you change, not just from your organization, but from the, the community. Um, and I, and I guess it's like, do you wear, do you go home and do you have to take your cape off every night? I mean, you're like a <laughs> com community hero. You really are. I mean, it's amazing. It's so, a gift uh, to God, Kyle. No. And that's what I want. That's my question. Why do you do what you do? I mean, you, you served in, in the military, uh, you're giving back all the time. Why do you, why? I just, uh, what makes you tick? Kyle, you almost bring in tears to my eyes, literally. And as I told Eric when he and I talked, it's all about giving back. Eric has to slow me down because I'm, I'm the type is to pay it forward. I was talking to an individual just today who's leading the BB King Museum, and she says she told her words to me was, "I never understood when I was your deputy of why you would do things, and you always said there's not a black and white answer. It's a gray area. And now that she's the president." 
she understands it. So by her saying that and fulfilling the mission of the B.B. King Museum and doing the things that we implemented and taking it even further, that's my reward. There is not a dollar you can give me. Or when kids, when I go back to the B.B. King Museum, we created a group called the B.B. King uh, Ambassadors. These kids had never been out of Indianola, Mississippi, and they were going to New, uh, Washington, D.C. for two weeks. Fast forward, I go back to Indianola today, and I left there in 2015. Those kids still hug me. I, I can't put a word on it. My God and Savior is the only thing I can say. I, I, I mean, that, that's all I can say. That's the gift that he gave me to give back. That's wonderful. That's awesome. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Eric now. I mean, you're you're a superstar too. Don't don't uh, get me wrong, but your uh, your projects have power. Uh, they they impact huge huge amounts of businesses, communities, people. Um, what's your next? I, I know you have a business and it's thriving, but what's your next adventure? Where what do you see out there that? that's going to make a big difference, uh, not just post or uh, COVID-19, but in the future. What do you what do you see out there? Well, I do think, you know, public private partnerships have a huge opportunity still within our country. And they've kind of taken a little bit of a bad rap in the last 15, 20 years, because a lot of times what that really meant to communities was a state sold their highway system for a quick dollar and to a private enterprise who operated it then for the next 50 years or whatever it might be. But something like the arch, and and I can use a, a really good example, although I don't think it's going to come to fruition at this point. I've been working for about a year with a group out of Seattle that was intending to build a, a cap over the highway of about 17 acres in the heart of downtown Seattle. The highway I-5 cuts off basically where people live to where people work. And so the idea that they could walk directly to work without having to cross I-5 was was it profound. I mean, that is a game-changing piece to that city. And what we took to the government, what we took to the state, especially to the Department of Transportation there, was this idea of a public-private partnership that we can't tell you how to operate a highway, but we can help you with how to engage the community, how, what should go into that area, you know, what will be utilized and engaged and enjoyed. And at first, the initial reaction from the WashDOT uh, executive director was we don't do public-private partnerships. For that exact reason I mentioned earlier is that public-private partnerships were seen as basically selling your soul for today and losing tomorrow. And when I, we talked through how we did it at the Arch with bringing in private dollars that could really support an environment, it changed his whole mind to the project and really opened up an opportunity that he hadn't thought through of how he could utilize, but also opened up the opportunity for the public to engage with it. I think there's going to be more of that, especially with this post-COVID world, because I think what we're seeing in St. Louis, what we're seeing in Dallas is we're going to need to all work together to improve what, what's going on within our, our community because we all care, but you're also not going to get private dollars in without have letting allowing them to have a seat at the table. And so that public-private partnership offers a unique model to really allow them to have a say in what's being done. Not necessarily take ownership or lead of it, but at least have a say for what's best for their businesses surrounding it. Yeah, what's what's really interesting, uh, and I think uh, our last, what, six or seven weeks that we've been doing this, every guest that's been on has talked about giving, which is a, a trend that, that I, I love to see. Um, and uh, and, uh, and you, you two are, are, are that, and I, and I appreciate what you're doing, and 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 we appreciate you you know obviously being on this on this session and and your insight is is incredible and what, again it, just keep doing what you're doing and we'd love to be a part of, of, of the movement so thank you thank you michael well i think we got still probably about seven minutes left so um if anybody has any questions please post them up or if you don't want to be shy 
and use the little raise your hand function. It'd be great to actually try that for the first time. So, um, looks like there are a couple of questions in the uh, chat. Uh, you know, so people asking about how how this will affect sporting events, and concerts. You know, I think we were kind of touching on blues at the arch a little bit there, but you know. I, I can personally say I, I I don't know whether I will return to sporting events this summer or this fall, um, even if I was allowed to, you know, and, and the comment of even with a vaccine, um, I can tell you I'll have them on when they come back on TV <laughs> without a doubt. But, you know, I, I think it's something that we're all having to weigh through. I think what's interesting is this seems very emotionally charged right now when people are thinking through these ideas, that you're getting very polar opposites of the perspectives to it. Everything from, you can't tell me to wear a mask and I shouldn't have to wash my hands if I go to that, that event and I'm going to sit as close to you as I want to sit, to I'm not going back to a sporting event ever. And I think it's interesting that we're so divided on this issue right now. Um, so I think, fortunately, there are a lot of people that are paid very well and, and much smarter than I am helping make these decisions. Yeah. You know, one question I have. Um, you showed the pyramid at the end of, like, just how everything sort of intertwined and how everything kind of, one thing leads to another, obviously, in this situation. What, what are some creative ways that you've seen organizations starting to work together with profit businesses to sort of mutually come at this together and work with each other? You know, I, I use I use one time and again, but they're one of my favorites, mainly because it's also an amazing product. Um, there is a shelter here for women who have been in abusive relationships. Um, so outside of the museum and in green space realm, but what they found is that a lot of these women were not able to leave because they didn't have financial support to leave. And so they were staying within these relationships. They partnered with one of the biggest chefs in St. Louis, and he created a chicken pot pie recipe for the organization. And so these women actually go then and they they make the pot pies. They're paid a fair, fair wage for making these pot pies. And they sell them throughout the grocery stores here in St. Louis, and they're phenomenal. They're great. I mean, there's several in our freezer right now. Um, and, you know, finding ways like that where you're expanding your within your mission, I think that's the key facet to it all, though, is staying within your mission so that you're not trying to do something that's going outside. You know, we talk a lot prior to COVID of scope creep within nonprofits, especially, and whether it's really what you're supposed to be doing. Um, Finding unique ways within it to to build revenues is a really great way for groups to grow and really ex expand both their the awareness that they exist, but also their fundraising dollars coming in. Dion, anything you'd like to add? Sorry. As usual, Eric sums everything up, leaves very little space for me to get in. <laughs> but he's, I mean, that's the CEO for you. I mean, he, he knows his stuff. He's great. Eric is great. Well, I love the idea about mission, right? What's the mission? Let's go get it. And I think y'all have done that. It's awesome. It doesn't get any better work than for Eric, I promise. You know what? Those pot pies, can I get them at Deerberg's or Schnucks? Yep, Deerberg's and uh, Straub's. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the restaurant out in Chesterfield. That's the big name restaurant that the chef is from, but... Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really kind of fun way, and they they ventured into I think it's like a blueberry pie as well that they do, or blueberry cobbler. Um, that's not my thing, but the chicken pot pie is incredible. <laughs> Any guns? Uh, yeah, Any guns? Thank you. Right. <laughs> yeah. So we we've got a couple of minutes. Anybody from the audience want to uh, unmute and say anything? Please do. If not, then uh, any closing comments from you guys, Michael. We'll leave it for a minute here, you know, just see a bit. Um, you know, while we wait for this question, I think my closing comment is just, um, you know, being from the city that's been uh, res 
like the recipient of the projects that you all have done, it's been pretty clear um, what that change has really caused over the past 15 to 20 years. Um, even just some of the projects I've worked on in the past with like East St. Louis, um, as well as communities within the city, it's um, obviously there's still a long way to go, you know, and I, I still hope that the, the city mends its divides over time and the generations are able to learn from the things that have happened in the past. You know, certainly I've learned from Pruitt Igo already, you know, just what an effect of a project like that can do. Um, so, you know, it's great that now these public private institutions um, and nonprofit institutions are really taken to heart the connections in the city. You know, it's not like building a football stadium, as we've learned, is not um, going to solve the problem. Uh, but building really transformative, culturally rich projects that are inclusive of everyone will. Um, so I'm excited to see just as you all are kind of in the epicenter of that where it's going to take you in the future. Um, actually, we have a question uh, from Jerry Renault. Um, he thank asked, you, Jerry. Thank you. Man. Yes, thank you. Jerry's always chiming in here, which is great. Uh, Jerry asks, do you see a difference between having a physical asset like a museum and having a community center and services? Do you see any difference between those two? I think it depends on, you know, what the intention is. So Dion used the example with the Blues Museum earlier and the developer using it as a catalyst for an entertainment district. You know, if you're using it to try to grow, you know, housing and restaurants, a physical presence like a museum has so much more of an effect. If you're looking for what the needs of a, an area are, you may be looking at a community center and services to improve the area that, that it is. But I think you kind of need to look at what the end goal is to define what the solution is. If you're looking at a bit from a building standpoint. Yeah, and, and the only thing I would add to that, Jerry, uh, Jerry, is to me, along with Eric said, they're one and the same. It is what what's your mission and your vision? If it's there to provide a service, just like with the National Blues Museum, it was to anchor an entertainment district, but at the same time, we were there to provide a service. So I'm not trying to give you a, a wishy-washy answer. It's all about the mission of what you're there to do. The, the developer had it as a, a anchor, but the mission of the museum took its own course. Yeah. And to follow up before, I know we're getting almost, we're over time, but I just want to thank Kyle and Michael for ha allowing Eric and myself to come on. This has been an awesome experience and I appreciate the hell out of it. <laughs> Hi, man. Thanks, Dion and Eric. Uh, truly, I mean, that's, this is what it's all about, right? Uh, people doing good things for people. Uh, that's what the conversation is and y'all y'all have done well. Thank you for the time. Michael? You want to say anything? Well, and you've been part of a lot of our conversations thus far, so we really appreciated just your time here. And you're definitely getting a lot of love here through the wall from Sharon and Jerry and Zyda, who's with the um, Adex, um, as well as Jessica Bolt with the Adex. You know, it's, I think we're excited to see where this thing goes. And it's obviously, you know, going in the direction that we've always hoped because of the discussions like this. So we definitely thank you for your time. Uh, to everyone on, obviously this is now open to a wider audience, so just please uh, feel free to share this, these talks with anyone that you think might be interested in partaking in the future. We're also figuring out ways to actually get these recordings online um, so that the uh, talks are documented over time. Um, and then looking forward to the day when Kyle and I can sit in the attics and, uh, you know, heckle each other in person. Uh, with our speakers, uh, hopefully not caught in that crossfire. But, uh, <laughs> you know, again, it'll be um, good. It'll be yeah, good. Well, everyone could unmute real quick. Yes, we, uh, yeah. We'd love to clap. give you all a round of applause. Thank you. Yes, please do. Thank you, guys. Thank you all very much. Yeah, we'll thanks see for having us next week. Thanks. All right.